Shubhadeep Mukhopadhyay ji and Manojna Shastri ji to present on Audrey Trushke. So Audrey Trushke is a well-known public intellectual, academic and social media activist. She is a professor at Rutgers University, uh, a member of American Institute of Pakistan Studies. Uh, she is a key driver of the uh, Hindutva Harassment Field Manual, uh, which is ostensibly meant to protect people from attacks against uh, Hindutva. She has received numerous accolades and grants for her contribution to South Asian cultural and intellectual history. At the same time, uh, there are allegations that uh, through her scholarship, as well as activism, she perpetuates blatant Hinduphobia. Uh, Trushke, however, dismisses such allegations. Uh, she labels all her detractors as uh, trolls or uh, Hindutvadis. That is the term she uses. And she has often claimed that she has been targeted by Hindus for belonging to the wrong color and the wrong sex. So in our essay, uh, what we do is we analyze in depth some of her key positions on Mughal history, Aurangzeb especially, Hinduism, Hindutva, and modern India. Uh, so during our study, what became clear is that uh, she is very uncomfortable uh, with the idea of a strong Indian state, a theme that we have seen earlier also in the other uh, uh, heads that were discussed. And she's also uncomfortable with the idea of dharma in India. So in this uh, specific presentation, I'll just cover two of her key uh, academic positions. So just a quick uh, uh, look at what is revisionism. Uh, so revisionism, it has its root in Marxist thought. So this is basically you're looking at uh, existing conclusions and adding newer sources, newer ev evidences to try to uh, get a better understanding of the past. It often leads to reinterpretation of historical accounts and challenges established views, mainstream narratives, as well as popular misconceptions. It has had its good uh, uses also because it has helped in uh, providing a better understanding of uh, indigenous people in former colonies like uh, America and Australia. So while revisionism is a good thing, when it is taken to extreme, uh, driven by either by uh, ideology or some kind of uh, uh, an agenda, it leads to what is called negationism. So people are made to doubt sources and uh, some people, they deliberately mistranslate text and derive questionable conclusions. Uh, an example uh, of uh, a very, uh, uh, with something all uh, Indians can, uh, can relate to is uh, swastiks, which is associated with Nazism. So the word Hakenkreuz in uh, German was translated as swastika very mischievously, and this has taken a life of its own. Uh, Examples of full-scale uh, uh, negationism, for example, Armenian genocide, uh, the genocide of Native Americans, Jewish Holocaust. So these were actually uh, denied for a very long time. Some still are. And there's a lot of literature which uh, I've given a few references. Uh, people could read that. In an Indian context, uh, there, has been, uh, there have been attempts to uh, present a particular narrative uh, which downplays much of the violence and persecution faced by people in the last millennia. So Trushke, this is where she comes in, she has actually carried forward this uh, uh, tradition of negationism, which I've tried to show with, we have tried to show with evidence. So she propagates an alternate history of India, where the persecutors, the religious persecutors are shown as blameless and often benevolent, while the victims are blamed uh, for all the ills which are facing Indian society today. So what are some of her key positions which, we've, which uh, uh, we have covered in our essay? So she claims that the, uh, the claims of temple destructions and uh, iconoclasm have been vastly exaggerated and mostly by uh, proponents of Hindutva, that it's all a, a figment of Hindutva imagination, that even if something did happen, like uh, an odd temple raising or two, the motivation behind it was not religious per se, but driven by real politic. And, uh, okay, so this is the best one. And that the Islamic invaders, they picked up the practice of temple destruction from Hindu kings themselves. This is one of her key positions. 
so I, I will cite all the evidence uh, at a later slide. She says that uh, uh, Aurangzeb perhaps destroyed maybe a handful of uh, temples and that the evidence is quite thin that it was part of the British divide and rule policy. And that is how uh, uh, this whole thing came about of um, Islamic invaders destroying uh, temples. Now, there's this book called Maasir e Alamgiri. Uh, it's an important source which uh, is about the life and times of Aurangzeb, and it uh, uh, very squarely contradicts her claims. Uh, it was written uh, three years after Aurangzeb died uh, by uh, Saki Mustaid Khan, and uh, the Inayatullah Khan, Kashmiri, who was Aurangzeb's secretary, so he made the entire records and uh, archives available to uh, the author, Saki Mustaid Khan. And this work actually details a lot of imperial orders, a lot of records of temples which were uh, destroyed during Aurangzeb's reign. So I'll just give you one specific example to show that this earlier claim that a few dozen temples, how that is wrong from this text. So this is in 1680. So you can look at the details. So, uh, oh. What this means is, if you add up all the numbers, uh, that these instances are very specific, very detailed. Uh, I mean, one, the information is unambiguous, and there is nothing fragmentary or incomplete about uh, the evidence which I had cited earlier. I mean, this is, these are taken from that book. It's an uh, it's a, uh, old Persian text from Aurangzeb's time. And in two months, 238 temples were destroyed. So this is far greater than the so-called uh, few dozen temples which she claims in her uh, in four decades. So why does she do that and how does she actually uh, explain this inconsistency? Because this is one book that nobody can actually, she's used it herself, as I'll show in a later case. So what she does is, uh, she denies the credibility of this entire book. So she says that the author Khan has a habit of exaggerating and uh, but why she thinks so, she does not tell us that. Uh, the fact that the author had royal ac had access to the royal archives uh, and state archives, yet we are told to believe, asked to believe that he made up all these very specific dates. Like if I'll just go back to the slide once again, you can quickly see, he's given the exact date on which day, how many temples at which place. So we are asked to believe by Trushke that all these are figment of uh, uh, this author's imagination. Now, uh, if uh, we refer to the work of Jadunath Sarkar, he had very uh, pointed out very early on that while it is true that many of these work are, have effusive praise for their rulers, in terms of facts, they are quite accurate. We cannot deny the, uh, the factual matter of these texts, although we may be dismissive of the language used and the, uh, the kind of effusive praise given. But while she dismisses this book on one hand, from the same book, she picks up one specific example to buttress her case that uh, uh, temple destruction was actually a very rare thing. I've cited that example. So on the one hand, she's dismissing the book when it comes to temple destruction. But same book she's using to uh, use her claim that no, uh, temple destruction is actually very uh, rare. So this is an instance probably of cherry picking, uh, evidence to suit her specific narrative. The second point that she talks about is iconoclasm. Uh, which is basically uh, religiously sanctioned uh, murti destruction or idol destruction. Uh, so uh, her thesis is that temples were essentially political structures. That is a thesis. And hence, when temples were destroyed, they were politically motivated destructions. In fact, it was the Hindu kings themselves who looted and defiled images of Hindu deities. Mm -hmm. That is a thesis. They destroyed each other's temples routinely and even commissioned poetry to celebrate such destructions. In fact, she takes this actually forward, this thesis forward and says that when Muslim invaders came to India for the first time, that is how they picked up this practice of uh, destruction of temples and raising the idols. So uh, what she writes is, so Aurangzeb followed suit in considering Hindu temples legitimate targets of punitive state action. So she's moved everything from the religious domain to a matter of uh, 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 polity or state politics. So now 
uh, now that uh, that has been taken care of, so we have to come to the part about Brahmins, uh, because uh, without Brahmin, a little bit of uh, Brahmin bashing, this entire analysis is not complete. So she now blames Brahmins themselves for being responsible for temple destruction. So how? The logic is that uh, uh, the greedy Brahmins, I mean, uh, you can see the quotes in the chapter I've shared, they were teaching false texts, uh, you know, false books uh, in the temples. And uh, Aurangzeb actually felt uh, uh, very sad that the uh, greedy Brahmins were misleading the s other uh, Hindus, the so-called lower castes. And out of compassion, he destroyed the temples associated with those Brahmins. That is her thesis. There's actually no evidence for these things, but that is what she claims. So, like I said, Hindu iconoclasm, it's an oxymoron. So yes, there were a few instances of Hindu kings taking away deities. It has happened before, but they were not destroyed. They were consecrated with great pomp and ceremony in the other kingdom. So it was precise opposite of idol smashing. On the other hand, uh, uh, the iconoclasm that we see during the inv invasion of whether it's India or other parts of uh, the Middle East, they were actually driven by uh, uh, religious region reasons completely. An example is uh, if you know this iconic image, uh, Bamiyan Buddha, before and after. This has happened within a lifetime. So there's absolutely no evidence that uh, uh, it was the Hindu kings who taught Muslims how to destroy murtis. Uh, these are based on various studies. I've, I've cited the sources that uh, a very systematic study of numerous texts have not shown such an evidence. In fact, many of the uh, Islamic chronicles, in whether it's mostly in Persian, they're extremely proud that they're following the religious tenets while uh, uh, destroying uh, temples. Uh, so on the Ayodhya judgment, Trishke has in fact authored an article uh, post the judgment from on the Ram Janmabhumi case, uh, showing very little understanding of either the Indian judiciary or even the entire matter at hand. She has cast aspersions on the judges of India Supreme Court and has said that the judgment copy is devoid of any history before the 19th century. In fact, she says that, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing that she has, uh, she claims to be a Sanskritist and has a background in Hinduism, while she says that Sri Rama is not even a historical figure, figure to begin with. And thus the onus now lies on the Hindus to first prove his historical existence. What Trishte seems to not have read in the 900 odd pages of the judgment are various sections considering the verses from sources such as the Skanda Purana, Ayodhya Mahatmya and so on, which build on the association of the place under dispute in Ayodhya with the birth of uh, Sri Rama. Trishle's uh, scholarship in pre-modernity is further called into doubt while she makes her scorn for Hinduism and its practitioners obvious when she remarks that most Hindus did not, I quote, did not much care about Ram's birthplace, an apathy indicated by the sheer lack of attention to this issue in pre-modern texts. Trishle's analysis in the, uh, in the article is in fact at times so infantile that she is actually counting the number of times the word Hindus is mentioned in the Supreme Court judgment and says it's been mentioned 299 times, while the Muslims is spoken relatively lesser, that is 174 times, and hence, you know, the judgment is partial towards the Hindus. So, while of course such uh, silly barometers, which are supposed to constitute judicial fairness, is shocking, it further it becomes further clear that uh, Trishke's issue is not whether the Supreme Court, you know, has defined Hindus or Muslims or whatever it is. But I think the issue comes from recognition that um, a group of biased motivated distortionists such as herself, increasingly no longer find currency today, right? So that is that is why in the judgment copy, when you have the unearthing of all the pillars which were previously there in the existing temple, the previous temple, all of these which are there when they have been, when they have been pointed out, Trushke in, instead accuses the Hindus of using sophistry in terms of presenting evidence for their case. 
So the evidence is not being considered on its own merit, but instead the Hindus are being accused of sophistry for presenting that evidence. Further, she seems to be rehashing notions from uh, colonial scholarship, where she perpetuates the idea of the Ramayana being an imaginary work. And thus, by modern legal standards, the Hindu claimants have no compelling evidence regarding Ram's life and birthplace. Uh, another section that we have considered in uh, the paper is uh, Trushke and her uh, episodes of uh, mistranslations, one particularly stands out. So Audrey Trushke has a long record of translating words from Sanskritam to present a colorful tone of passages from key Hindu texts. And in some case, even manufacturing what she wants to read into a text. Despite her claimed expertise in Sanskrit, the numerous examples of Trushke's translations crawl into question not only her ability, but demonstrate a pre prejudiced gaze. Consider, for instance, the 2018 episode where Trushke, when she was translating passages from the Ramayana to attribute to Devi Sita, lines which were a complete fabrication and not even present in the original Valmiki text. Referring to supposed lines 6.102 to 106, Trushke claims to use the Sanskritist Robert Goldman's translation and says, Devi Sita, loosely, I quote, loosely, called Bhagwan Rama, a, I quote, a misogynist pig and untruth, I end quotes. So when challenged by many to produce the exact lines in the Valmiki Ramayana from the text to back up her claims, Trushke has said that she has been using Goldman's translation. When a concerned reader, in fact, uh, Mr. Venkat Vaikuntanarayanan reached out to the Sanskritist Robert Goldman himself with Trishke's claims. Goldman wrote back, clearly refuting any such interpretation of the text in his work. In fact, he said, what Trishke has done was translate the text in ways that suited her agenda and attributed it to the authority of Goldman's work for credibility. Uh, Goldman's quote is, on the slide, exactly what he said. He says he found it extremely disturbing, but perhaps not unexpected. Despite Dr. Goldman's uh, re clear rebuttal, uh, despite uh, Dr. Goldman's rebuttal, uh, Trishke neither withdrew her statements in, nor issued any correction. In fact, even uh, Nityananda Mishraji, who is another Sanskritist, has also provided a detailed analysis of this episode. And Trishke's tweets on this matter remain on her account to this day. What Trishke did instead of issuing a withdrawal or a correction was portraying herself as a victim in this entire episode. And she's the victim apparently from the hatred and abuse which supposedly Hindus uh, shared on her by pointing out the truth. So she's written in the wire that uh, she did not uh, where, without addressing specifically the origin of her translations, instead she comes across as somehow being proud of the controversy and shockingly, and one even wonders at her delusions when she tries to compare the situation to the original in the text and she being in a place similar to Devi Sita. Trishle has in fact frequently resorted to victimhood and this has become a rather predictable part of her modus operandi which also calls into question if it is all a part of a strategy to garner more reportage and eyeballs. So in our paper, these, apart from these two and what uh, Shubhadeep has presented, we have cited all the evidences and in the paucity of time, we refer you to the original. Thank you. Uh, thank you Shubhadeep and Varugna. Uh, I kindly request author Abhas Maldahia to comment. A very good evening to all of you. I'm glad that I've been invited to speak on uh, speak on one of the topic of, of the book, of which all the ten of them are necessarily very important, and certainly catered to an aspect which we all young Indians and also those who are who have progressed and read all the works of all these scholars in the past, considering them to be something of scholarly nature, need to look at. Now. Given my background, I do come with a uh, background of architectural education and urban design. Uh, 
plainly speaking, someone may find that what an architect or a person of architecture has got to do with history. But I always do say, whenever I'm in a public gathering or somewhere, when I'm given to speak around history, I do say that perhaps architects and historians ka jan jan mantra ka rishta hai because what we will, we will build as architects today will become the subject for the historians in the future. So it goes on and on. So what was done in the past by architects is being read by us. So somehow that always had brought my interest into the subject. But uh, in the era of social media, I was certainly very alien to social media and I came into it only in 2017, where my first encounter with auditors happened. And um, just like a very uh, naive guy, I always thought that, oh, fine, it's social media. So it's a place where you can interact, you can discuss with the people. And of course, uh, given that they're scholars and whatnot, they will revert back or maybe there will be some course of discussion or debate around something. So the first instance was the debate around Hinduism and Hindutva. Hindu it was back in 2017, October. She wrote a detailed thread explaining that how Hinduism is different from Hindutva and that narrative is somewhat very much perpetrated into all of her literature. When you, right now, I was also going through the chapter on the Audrey Truske, and I found that the authors or editors have certainly gone into detail to explain that how her agenda about, uh, uh, about vilifying Hindutva is a prime focus. Now, she made a case that Hindutva was an idea which emerged when the fascism and the Nazism were, br br were brewing up. And that somehow led to uh, let Savarkar and the other nationalists to come up with the idea of Hindutva. Now, she also built a case that Hinduism is something which as a term were coined, certainly it's a fact that it was coined in 1830s through an affidavit. So perhaps there was no such thing called Hinduism which was existing before as if there was nothing called water so we were not drinking water. Certainly Hinduism was existing and Hindutva certainly didn't emerge in 1920s as she was claiming to be. Because the idea of Hindutva, or uh, like how many people may like to look at it as Hindu nationalism, is doesn't goes back only to Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj in form of Hindavi Swaraj, but it goes back to the establishment of Vijayanagar Empire because it was formed as a surgent a strong opposition to the Muslims, uh, Muslim supremacy. And that is how the empire got into being. And the legacy was continued by the Marathas and so on and on. Era was the 1920s. And, uh, but before that, mind you, most of these people, including Dr. Tharoor, including Audrey Truske, and many of them do say that Hindutva as a term was introduced for the first time in the booklet written by V. Savarkar, but that's not true. That's very far from truth. Because it was for the first time spoken in 1892 by Chandranath Basu. But his idea of Hindutva was very much different than what Savarkar was trying to convey for. Savarkar's idea of Hindutva was more about opposing the political Islam which was emerging. The era was 1920s where Hindus were betrayed at the hand of the Khilafat movement. A lot was happening. Indian Muslims were mobilized to fight for a caliphate, which even the Muslims of Turkey were not looking to safeguard. So they were completely mobilized. The Mopla genocide had happened. A lot were happening. Savarkar was back there in the cellular jail. And the incidences, what he saw, made him to come up with the idea that there has to be a notion of Hindu nationalism per se, or Hindutva. And he defined it very, that book, that book, very booklet of Hindutva is very profound, and it goes very well in nature. Now, Audrey Tuske goes on to uh, blame Hindutva for uh, it being kind of, uh, 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 it's uh, very uh, racial in nature. It, uh, it is casteist. But again, when you start looking into the facts of Hindutva, many traditional, traditionalists or the people who espouse for the traditional ethos of the Hinduism may not like what really comes out of the mouth of Savarkar because he says that Varnashram needs to be disbanded. It needs to be dis demolished completely. So how they are perceiving the Hindutva to be, including Audrey Truske, is certainly not whom she is saying to be the founder of Hindutva, that is Sevi Savarkar, the wrongly even thought of so. 
Now, I did take care to define the whole thing in a matter of thread, a longish thread. I do have this habit of writing long threads on Twitter, which goes on to 100 tweets at times, and it will be a long chain of tweets. I did that. I went into the explanation in terms of the linguistic event that uh, Hindutva is uh, Hindu plus Twa. Hinduism is Hindu plus ism. Now, what does Twa stands for? Twa is something, it necessarily defines you to be in a state of something to which it's added. Like if you add Twa to Nari, it's Naritwa. It means that you are in a state of being a Nari. Likewise, when I say Hindutva, it necessarily means I'm in a state of being Hindu. So perhaps in a time when Sri Ram is pleading for something, it is also a Hindu nature, but the moment he is angry with Samudra and he picks up the uh, bow and arrow to do what he do, that also is Hindutva. So necessarily, Hindutva cannot be categorized into being pacifist or someone aggressive. It's just a very basic nature of a Hindu. That is Hindutva. Now, when it comes to the idea of Hinduism, Hindu plusism, it certainly was added as Trotsky says that in the 19th century, it's 1830s, if it, if it came to and brought the word called Hinduism, but Ism was always used as a term for a movement what West saw as a derogatory idea back then. That's where ism st stood for. Later on, when a lot of art movements arose, we got modernism, we got, uh, uh, we got deconstructivism, there were many more ideas. Now, what is very interesting in this idea of ism, they all cater to a singular idea. Deconstructivism can't merge with modernism. While when you say Hindutva plus Twa, it talks more about the diversity. So necessarily Hinduism, though people may not like it, but what the Britishers brought in as place was more of an oxymoron. But yes, idea of Sanatan Dharma was existing from quite long. Now, other, uh, uh, other point which, uh, what Audrey always emphasizes upon is that, um, and I came across it uh, very recently, only two years back. It was more that um, uh, uh, the idea that Hindus also demolished a lot of structure of Buddhist. And she wrote a very interesting paper about it. That paper is around uh, 45 pages or something. I read it. I tried to understand her whole thesis about it, that what's wrong there. Now, I saw that she is linking back to the work of D.N. Jha. Then it happens, like you start scratching and you will find and find, and there's a lot of deposits of a lot of corruption which has happened in the past. Now, uh, we, we heard a lot about Romila Thapar, but we have to give credit to Romila Thapar, but that she now disagrees that Pushwamitra Sangha would have demolished so many stupas, like the kind of allegation which are made against Pushwamitra Sangha, but Audrey Truske somehow doesn't agree to it. She also builds a case that uh, uh, Nalanda was not destroyed by Bhaktiar Khilji. Now, how does she do it? I, while I was going through your chapter, you have posed a question that uh, she is saying that uh, uh, the the narratives given by the Islamic chronicle, chroniclers are not very, not something which you can trust upon. They are very they can be exaggeration. Actually, in this paper you have put the question, but in this very paper which I am talking about, here she has answered that why you can't trust them. She says that Islamic chroniclers generally have this tendency to exaggerate. Now, if you pick this strand then unfortunately the whole history of Islam will de get debased because the first time the first narrative of the biography of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was written around 200 years after he was he died that's in 632 he's supposed to have died but the first biography appears around 800 something uh, the work of Ibn Hisham which exists in the form of a hard copy with us now the first hadiths do appear again all around the 9th century now, we are made to believe that Bin Qasim, actually I had the discussion about this with Dr. Els recently during Earth Literature Festival. So, uh, Bin Qasim is said to have arrived in 712 AD, but the first text to talk about the Battle of Sindh, Battle of Sindh, not Bin Qasim yet, appears in 892 AD. It means after 180 years. So who would have been hero of that civilization? You will not talk about him for 180 years. It is not possible because the world is knowing how to write, how to read. Then for the first time, Bin Qasim is elaborated more detail in Chachanama, which appears to be a text of 13th century, so 500 years gap. So yes, 
Islamic chroniclers have been exaggerating, but if you take that stand, then the whole history of Islam will start to get debased. Now, other point what she says that while this text uh, with that supports the case of Bhaktiyar Khilji having demolished uh, the Nalanda, it, uh, it is written by uh, Minhaz, Minhaz, is the name, Minhaz, or Minhaz is the name of the person who wrote the text. He writes this text after listening to a narrative given by a man, given by two people, two brothers rather, in Fargana. Those people were actually with Bhaktiyar Khilji while this all was happening. She says that because it's a second-hand account, because the guys who were the part of the campaign have told the narrative, so it can't be trusted. Now, fair enough. 40 years gap, but they, they narrate it after a 40 years gap. Now, if you start looking at the geography, now there are three universities which are claimed to be broken that time or ransacked. Now, she says that Nalanda is the only place which exactly cannot be located. But while someone is coming from Delhi, so there will be a sequence, there will be Nalanda, then Orandapuri will come in the last and the one more university is there, which is uh, Vikramshila. So that will be the sequence. You will have to first cross the Nalanda, then you will go to the second, and then you will go to the third. So the first university is not named. The first place is rather not named. Then she talks about one of the Tibetan monks who comes in, right? And she uses him as a defense that if Nalanda was destroyed, then why, how did he come over here? But that guy himself writes in the Tibetan text that Nalanda was not too full of its glory, how it existed. And Thus, we are talking about Truske, they used to call Truskas, uh, the Turks were called something like that, the Turks were still raiding the place. The, the continuous raiding was still happening. So certainly the place was not at peace and there was a continual raid by the Islamic invaders. That was ongoing. She again, uh, <laughs> it's very ironical that she talks about the fatwas of, uh, farmans of Aurangzeb and then says that, you know, uh, though he may have ordered, but maybe that this many temples may not be, may not have been demolished. But uh, for this, again, we need to go back to where these guys to come from. So uh, um, many people do call these people Mughals, but they're actually not Mughals. I don't know how many of you uh, are aware about it. They call themselves Timurids all the time. They have been abusing Mughals left and right. When you read their biographies, whether it's Babar Nama or it's the work of Humayu, they are just not very happy with the Mughals. Mughals are the people who do come from the lineage of Changiz Khan and those who come from the lineage of Temur, they call themselves Timurids. So Changiz Khan is in a fifth lineage of a common, uh, common ancestor of all of them, that is Tunamai Khan, and the 10th lineage is Temur. So it's like this, Changiz Khan, Temur over here, and there is one. Now Temur has made himself too different from the Mughals. He is a highly Persianized person who is too much into learning the Persian. So now this also gives you a reason that why Mughals were so much into, or Timurids rather, to be very honest and clear, were too much into Persian than any other language. Now, Taimur's biographer Yazdi, Yazdi the person who wrote his biography, he says that Taimur's ultimate aim was to spread Islam, demolish the structure. He is stating it outrightly. Three fathers visited the court of Akbar in 1580. Uh, they are the Portuguese, for, they are some European, uh, European fathers. They, pre, pre, uh, they visit the court of Akbar and they say that the, uh, the Mazars have appeared over the demolished Hindu temple. So they are making this observation. So how come Audrey Truske is saying that, you know, it, nothing like that would have happened. So this was very much in nature of the civilization or rather, uh, the society by which they were coming from. In fact, when you read the text in a document of, uh, uh, of Babur himself, while he was entering Kabul, so uh, he, he, he has a lot of opposition from a lot of tribes. They are not letting him in. So he's in similar habit of making the, uh, the tombs of the skulls and he's again talking about the idolaters. Uh, and uh, there's a part in the book where you have mentioned that auditor's case translating in it in some much, much more different way than Jaduna Sarkar has translated. What is very interesting, and actually there was a point which was raised that why we should not read Persian and learn Persian, rather we should learn our language. But I do uh, take the word of Jadunath Sarkar. 
Jadunath Sarkar had said to his pupils, to his pupils, he wrote a letter or rather he had given an address while he was retiring. And he said that, you know, you need to know the language of the authorities. So where my, because Mughal history is something of my interest. So language of authority was certainly Persian. I took the uh, thing to learn Persian. So I learned Persian and I have gone through that text and there the word exclusively uses kafir. That's the word, quote, kafir, unquote. So kafir doesn't be translated as how Eaton has done or how Audrey has done. It certainly means the people who are not Muslim, as simple as that. So there is no, uh, no amount of doubt which can say that uh, the Aurangzeb has any intention to protect any temples or he had, because if you start reading his fatwas, he even goes on to talk about um, just putting a ban onto the Hindu celebration. There's a long list of the bans which, what he has also spoken about. So how can we expect that he will not do even, and uh, come on, uh, Audrey is trying to play a car, victim card of being a female and whatnot. But uh, we all remember back in 2021, a NASA intern was, 2020, a NASA intern was mocked just because she put a Lakshmi goddess by the side of a computer. So uh, we have seen all kinds of things. So perhaps we should not buy, certainly we should not buy these kind of arguments given by the people who are, not very clear how to read the primary sources. Thank you, and it's really a nice work. Thank you.